Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives. We are bringing you what we're calling our Christmas, our holiday special. This is very special. We have Rich Logis. He is the founder of Perfect Our Union. You can find him at perfectourunion.us. He also is the organizer of a group called Leaving MAGA. He's going to tell you his very, very personal story of how he came to the conclusion that uh, MAGA was actually something that in many ways uh, was destroying his own life and how he came out of that. And uh, this interview, I think, touched all of us probably more than anything that we've done recently. So share it with your family and friends over the holidays, folks. Please. It's really important. Hello, Rich Lawson. We are so grateful that you are here with us today. Um, we've really been looking forward to this. And I, I say it every single week, every time we think we've done our best interview and our most important interview, someone like you walks into our life and uh, we do another incredibly valuable interview. This, this is really near and dear to us because Jim and Hi-Fi and I, from the beginning, have preached that we have to welcome people back. We have to say we know that there has been a lot of psychological manipulations to get people into MAGA. And you are sitting here right before us saying that you can get out and tell us a bit about your journey so people can understand uh, you know, where you're at and, and how you kind of had the courage to you know, evaporate that shame and stand up and say, I'm not doing this anymore. Well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, let me just start by showing everyone. I've got my little Reed Band book shirt here. Nice. So, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, you know, I'm not a dress up guy, but when I when I do have something fancy, I'm going to make sure it sends uh, an important message. So I really appreciate you having me here. I I have to say that when I decided to publicize that I was that my remorse for supporting Trump and MAGA, I honestly did not think anyone would care. I did it for me. I figured if a couple people here and there said, good job, Rich, fine, you know, I'd welcome that, but I didn't really actually think anyone would care. And I'm happy to say I was wrong about that. And my my entire journey for my entree into MAGA, actually, we have to go back 15 years prior. So in the year 2000, I graduate college. I am from New York, I'm in Florida now, grew up in a middle-class household, uh, my parents did the best that they could. We weren't want for everything, but we we did have a lot of the struggles that a lot of other middle class families had. Uh, we had a home foreclosed on. We we had to move to what my mother and father thought was a, a better area for education, and and we had a lot of those struggles that I think MAGA actually spoke to, which I'll get to in a moment. And so yeah. for for me, you know, I, I I graduate college in the year two thousand, and in that year, I'm living in New York. I voted for Ralph Nader. And the re there are a couple reasons I voted for Nader, but one of the reasons I would say the primary reason is because I realized that both parties didn't like him. Now, granted, the Democratic Party, <laughs> the, the, the Democratic Party disliked him more than did the Republican Party, but there was there was enough uh, there was enough dislike amongst both the parties where I thought, hmm, if he's disliked by both parties, I I was a burgeoning anti two-party guy at that point in my life as 23 years old. And I thought, okay, I'm in. Like, as soon as I saw that he was disliked, he had that that rebellious maverick quality. He was speaking to issues that I thought were important. And I was in. And, and at that was the start for me of, of becoming, yes, unreasonably speaking, but I became this anti-two-party system guy with such disdain for the two parties. I felt like they were two sides of the same coin. I felt like that they only were appealing to a small slice and segment of the population. And I felt like Ralph Nader pretty well and effectively spoke to that. I also know being in New York that my vote wouldn't matter in the Electoral College. So I had I, I had a little bit added incentive to, to support him. Wow. Now, throughout, throughout to, from 2000 to 2015, I often voted third party. Occasionally, we would vote for one of the major party candidates if I felt like they were just going to get totally routed in the election. I didn't want him to lose that badly. So I, I supported occasionally some of the two party candidates. But then all of a sudden, as I'm building this this uh, this anti two party brand, because I had a lot of different endeavors trying to promote this idea, none of them took off, probably for the better. 
all of a sudden we come to 2015. Now I was a journalist right out of college. I was working for a local newspaper. I was covering business news, a variety of different industries. In the year 2015, I remember when Trump came on the scene, I wasn't one of these guys who was, I, I supported him when he came right down the escalator. People who say that now probably really don't mean it, but I wasn't really supported. Now, why did I become, how did I go from Ralph Nader to Donald Trump in the course of 15 years? I figured out pretty quickly that both parties disliked Trump. But it was it was different from Nader, because whereas with Nader, it was really one party who more than the other really loathed Nader. With Trump, I felt like the loathing was pretty comparable between the Republicans and Democrats. And and as he started to more and more talk about issues that were were I, I think they were he was touching on issues of economic worries and people feeling like they were unseen and unheard and not recognized. Being this outsider, a true civilian, no government, no military, who came in and said, the politicians have failed you, let's take a sledgehammer to the system. I was in, guys. I knew both parties didn't like him. I felt like we needed a son of a bitch in that kind of position. And so in the very beginning, I would say it started a little bit as a curiosity, but as time went on, I really ingratiated myself entirely into supporting Trump. First, thank you. I think you just sort of gave us some incredible intel. Our friend Melissa Jo Peltier directed a documentary yes. about uh, Ex MAGA, and uh, I have not Great heard that. I, I, brilliant. I've not heard that particular uh, gateway spoken so uh, eloquently yet. So thank you very much. The other thing I just want to say is I'm sorry your family's home was foreclosed on. That should never have happened. The government should have done better. It was one of the cruelest episodes uh, in our history, and that shouldn't have happened to anybody. They could have sold people their houses back 50 cents on the dollar and everybody would have been okay, but that did not happen. So I wanna tell you very much that I am sorry, that's grief and that's loss and it's terribly, horribly disruptive. So. Um, just making sure that, you know, you know, that we understand that uh, trajectory you just said actually makes perfect, perfect sense. And so that said, um, and we've already let our viewers know that that you're actively embracing other people to come join you, but kind of just walk us through next steps, what really happened from there. Sure, sure. And, and I don't say this as a self defense, but I think supporting Trump out of out of a a skepticism of the two-party system out of these feelings of not being heard and seen. I, I think that those are pretty anodyne reasons. I don't think they're actually very controversial for saying, okay, I'm going to give this person a chance because what we've been doing hasn't worked as well as it could have. You know, it wasn't that I got involved, and I, I know some did, but it wasn't like I got involved in MAGA because I liked what he said about immigrants or what he said about Muslims or what he or, or a lot of the dehumanizing language. I knew that when he was saying it, I wasn't in favor of it. But that's a segue, Heidi, into what you just said there, because something about my more and more becoming MAGA is that in real time, one doesn't realize that they're becoming deeper and deeper and deeper into the movement. And, you know, there are figures out there like Dr. Stephen Hassan. I've been on his show before and and and, and I'm, I'm not trained whatsoever in psychology or therapy. And I realize that some may disagree on whether MAGA is a cult or not. I will tell you, for me, it became that way. And I wasn't even cognizant as it was happening. And so as I decided to uh, become more and more uh, in support of Trump, I went on public record in a radio show. Uh, before the election, and I said, Trump's going to be the nominee, he's going to win the general election. And of course, most people laughed, thought I was crazy, thought I was nuts. And the reason I thought that is because when I was out and about, it doesn't matter where I was, the doctor's office, the library, the, the where the kids went, complete total strangers talking about the election. Sometimes they'd whisper and say, you know, Rich, I'm, gonna I'm actually going to vote for Trump. I felt it on the ground. And as I was feeling it on the ground, I felt like I was a part of something 
that was going to be historic. And what's just as a side note on this, I think what's actually so, I mean, there's so many reasons as I'll get into about why I left MAGA and the remorse. One of the, the, the when I look back on this, the fact is that Trump's election, when we speak about it historically, was an unprecedented moment. There had never been an actual true civilian president in our history. Everyone had always been in the government and or been in the military, but not Trump. And so when, when, I, when I decided that I was going to support this campaign, I did for, for pro bono, I did work that normally you'd be paid for. I wrote part of the call script for the Trump campaign. So anyone who received a call from the campaign or made a call on behalf, they were hearing texts that I partly wrote. That's normally a paid position. I did that pro bono. I was a true believer. And I allowed myself, and I, and I have to emphasize allowed myself because it's very important in the work of helping others to leave MAGA that we do have to recognize that all of us have agency. Because we, we can't say that we've given up all of our faculties and capabilities to process information and come to conclusions, at least with some of our own thinking influencing the outcome. So I, I allowed myself to be influenced by those who weren't just opposed to Democrat policies and style and substance in the candidates. I was allowing myself to be influenced by people who viewed Hillary and the Democrats as existential threats. And one of the reasons I allowed myself to be influenced that way, looking back on it, is because while I was very political, I was also a very ignorant person. And when you look at the, the two-party system part of my story in, in the lead up to the election, before Trump came on the scene, it's very hard for a lot of people to remember this, but if we think back on it, the expected election was going to be Jeb Bush versus Hillary Clinton. And even apolitical people I knew when Trump came on the scene, I remember apolitical people who did vote for Trump eventually because I persuaded them to, and I'm sorry for that. Even they said to me, another Bush and another Clinton, didn't we fight a war to, to, uh, uh, to gain autonomy and independence from a monarchy, from political dynasties? Even apolitical people were thinking that. So imagine me sitting here as the anti-two-party crusader. Like I'm looking at this as, oh, we, now we're going to have another Bush and another Clinton when we've had them for many, many years already. There was a perfect storm for Trump to come. And I think that some of that storm opened up the door for a person like myself who, who did feel like, yes, we need somebody to come in and take a flamethrower to this place. Yeah. And, one, and, and once, you know, and I, I remember on election night, and I, I'm writing this little ebook as part of Leaving MAGA, which I'm not going to sell it. People can download it and get it for no cost once I'm up and running here. I actually opened the book with election night. And I remember on election night 2016, there, there was, it's, it's more experiential than explicable, but I just remember that feeling of having done something that had never been done before. Literally the entire world was against Trump. I mean, it wasn't just the two parties. Other, yeah. Our allies around the world said, how could anyone even consider voting for this guy? And a presidential election, is the most visible competition of any kind in the world. More people are following the presidential election than the World Cup or the Super Bowl or the Olympics or any other event, political or otherwise. I felt like we were validated. We were vindicated. We were heard. We worked on the grassroots. We stopped the existential threat. And I allowed myself to begin to think that. And once someone has concluded that the opposing party does present an actual threat against your life and your livelihood and your family that person who thinks that will support anyone or anyone or anything thank you for anyone or anything and that was me thank, i thank allowed you. myself that i just i want to thank you so much for sharing your truth and walking us through that and i didn't realize until you were talking about it that the election night and the morning after is probably the most one of the most painful nights in my life. I can't even, I can't even talk about it. Actually, we had Jason Van Tatenhove on our show. Yes, yes. He testified in front of the January sixth committee. He was a propagandist for the Oath Keepers. His gateway was a healthy distrust of government. He got sucked into something because he didn't trust government. He listened to conspiracy shows, and okay, so now you have your win, and you went through four years of Trump and you voted for him again. 
describe the higher the low points in that four years so we understand why you were still thinking that this was a better choice for America. Thank, thank you for mentioning the other side of election night, that there were tens and tens of millions, more, more, more millions than who supported Trump based on the popular vote. We, we felt there's that contrast and, and the stark contrast is such that, that we felt like as part of the winning side of the 2016 election, that because we were on the right side, we were the good, the other side was the evil, from, from that time, Heidi, until 2020 in that four year period, increasingly, I and I speak only from my own self and my own experience, increasingly, I became more of this person. I viewed myself as this patriotic soldier in a war for, the, for, for, for not just what was happening in the here and now in the country, but I actually viewed MAGA forward facing. So I, I, I didn't live through the 50s and 60s, which a lot of the Make America Great Again propaganda does appeal to that nostalgia because nostalgia is very, it's a very natural feeling we have as a species. And so I, I wasn't looking at it like, well, in the 1950s and 60s, everything was great. The, the Boy Scouts brought their shotguns to school. We had prayer in school. And don't mind the black people who were fire hosed on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We're going to forget about that one for a moment. I didn't go through that. I was looking at it forward facing. Had a business. I had just had, a, I had just had my first child in 2016. I became increasingly a person who surrounded myself with others who felt like, we're the real Americans. We're fighting this war. We are on the right side. And anybody, whether they're Democrat or a rhino Republican in name only or a globalist, it was a very binary black and white world. You are with us or you are against us. There is no middle ground. Anyone who plays the middle is going to be considered an enemy combatant. And I became this person so much so that when I mentioned before about not, you're not. So one doesn't realize as they're becoming this person in real time. I woke up thinking about MAGA. I went through my day thinking about it. I went to bed thinking about it. Christ, I probably dreamt about it. Forget about taking a day off. I didn't even take an hour off. And I did that year after year after year after year. And this is next point is one that I, I'm hoping I can expand upon with the leaving MAGA work because. When I was in that, when I was the MAGA soldier, Trump was the general. Yes, I voted Republican. I actually didn't even consider myself a Republican or a conservative. I looked at myself as I'm a MAGA Trump nationalist. I was in favor of nationalism. I said isolationism is the better course more times than not. Trump is the leader. When he's attacked, we're attacked. Press attacked him, they're impugning our integrity. Mitt Romney attacked him. Mitt Romney is impugning our integrity. The so-and-so group, whether it's the New York Times or, the, or, or President Obama or anyone else, the more that they attack, the stronger that already strong bond became. And, that, and that's a broad point that is going to really inform the leaving MAGA work because one of the, one of the very strong, strongly, imp I'm imploring others who are going to hear this, is that I understand now looking back on this and why right now so many will have very strong anti-MAGA feelings. And sometimes there's a temptation to, to, to label a MAGA or Trump voter as, look at this stupid person, this uncouth person, this is this bigot. Most MAGA voters deep down are good people. I know that they're not all good people. Just like anyone, any group does not have all good. Most MAGA voters deep down, there is a goodness and there's a decency to them. And if, if, it, if impugning the integrity of MAGA voters worked to get them out of MAGA, nobody would be MAGA. I mean, how many billions of words have been written and spoken about the evils of MAGA voters and, and the, the homophobic, Islamophobic, transphobic, anything in the middle of that? If that actually works saying that about them, we wouldn't have to worry about MAGA. MAGA would be done and over with, but in reality, the exact opposites happened. It has strengthened that bond. Deplorables, right? 
What happened when Hillary Clinton called the MAGA movement deplorables? I have a very specific story on that that I think really give another really good example of what it was like being in the MAGA world as a MAGA soldier. I've been to probably 50 rock concerts in my life. I mean, I've seen, you name it, you know, an artist. I've, I've, I mean, I was at a, a concert in Madison Square Garden years ago where the band Pearl Jam played. It was so loud in the arena, the stage was bouncing. Like the stage was, and, and the band, if you look at the footage, the band has no idea. They're looking around up and down like they think it's an earthquake. I was at a concert where that happened. After the deplorable comment, there was a rally in Miami. It was the first rally after the deplorables comment. I was there with my wife and some family friends. When Trump came out, the Les Miserables song, I think it's called Les Deplorables, it was playing on the loudspeaker. Trump comes to the stage, everyone quiets down, and he says, welcome all you deplorables. Concerts I'd ever heard, I'd never heard a concert as loud as the response at that moment. And that's that was in June. And I turned to my wife and, and her friends and I said, you watch and see, Trump's going to win this election. We're like, oh, you're crazy. No. When that happened, and this is a hot take that I can't prove, but I'm going to offer it. I think that Hillary Clinton lost the election the night that she mentioned deplorables. Because here's where she really effed up. What's not as well known about that talk she gave is that after saying that she actually said heidi something that you mentioned earlier before that that some of the trump voters had some valid and legitimate concerns and it was it's somewhat explaining why they were supporting trump she had said that not prefaced by deplorable she probably would have won the election i really think that that was the night where it all started to unspool for her. Because once you have branded your, once you branded your opposition, that's exactly how we viewed it. Like we were proud to say we were deplorable. We, yes, we are the deplorables. We're yeah. the right side. We're the good side. We're the patriotic side. We're the side that the framers would have supported. Not Hillary, not Obama, not Tim Kaine, not Tom Perez at the DNC. No, no, no. We were the ones. Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. would have been on board with us. George W. Right? Jimmy Madison would have been with us. All of that together is what was the glue for us to be united in the goal of conquering our enemies. And, and, that's, and, exact, and that's exactly how we went about our life in MAGA. We never took an hour off in, that, in yeah. the pursuit of that goal. Yeah. I just want to thank you for that explainer and high five for that. Uh, observation. Um, so as I'm listening to you and just roiling with emotion and very grateful, um, Jason Stanley, who wrote the book, How Fascism Works, everything you're describing are tools from the fascist playbook that Trump was, was deploying. The victimhood, the only I can fix it, the mythic past, uh, all of it, the othering, and yes. and Hillary may have made it easy when she would say something like that, but she also had the Russian war machine attacking her every single statement and wedging every single issue along with the, uh, you know, what we call the fifth column in America working right alongside them. So there were a lot of factions at play um, that, that were both... Um, obvious to some academics and very, very invisible to others. But I just needed to get that out because I'm hearing what you're saying and realizing just how effective these hundred year old tropes still are. Um, yes. So leading up to the next election. And, and the point on Hillary, and I just want to say in hindsight, I, I would have, I wish that I could have voted for Hillary. Uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was how she would have managed COVID, at least on a federal level. So yes, I I would have, if I could go back in time, I would have voted, I would have supported Hillary. I might have been a little bit of a hold your nose Hillary voter, but I would have voted for her. And there there is a part of this big picture where I, I and I, I have so many thoughts and emotions that go through my mind on this point. And I want to try to make it as concise as I can. I think that there is some denial on the side of the Democratic Party about what maybe their contribution over time may have been to pave the road for 
for the opening for MAGA and Trump. I don't think it's a both sides issue, though. Conservatism, more than any other ideology, opened the door, rolled the red carpet out for MAGA. And yes, I would have liked to have supported Hillary time and do it. I do think, though, that Hillary did have, objectively speaking, there was a trust issue there with her. There was a who is she, right? And, that, and when someone is in politics for three decades, as she was, and people are still asking, fair or unfair, they're still asking, I don't really know this lady. Like, who is Hillary? No one had to ask that question about Donald Trump. And I know because of his international brand and his, his name and his, his businesses and all that, no one asked that question about, well, you know, Trump, I know he's a, yeah, I don't really care for the guy, but you know what, I'm going to vote for him. And I will tell you guys that there are people I knew, again, not very political, when Hillary made a deplorables comment, voted for Trump on that. Because they said, you know what, I may not be able to stand this guy, but it is totally unacceptable that a candidate for president would say about Americans that they were deplorable. So right then and there, when I found, when I started to hear that, I thought, man, we are going to win this thing. We are going to do this. And I just think that that point about Hillary having her own problems as a candidate mixed with some comments, mixed with a perfect storm that opened a door for Trump. And with the Russian interference, I'll tell you how, I'll tell you essentially how MAGA views that. MAGA looked at the Russian interference and said, well, all candidates seek out foreign assistance. What's the big deal? We all, everybody does. You don't think Mitt Romney did it. You don't think Barack Obama did it. So you can hear in all of this, even a lot of what I'm saying, you could hear a defense and justification of our rhetoric and our actions and our choices. Because if you feel like you are up against a life or death enemy, you're going to defend and justify anything you can. It, it, it bad as it might be, there's always, but the other side is worse. And that's what led to, for me, all of the dehumanization that I, uh, that I again, willfully engaged in against not just politicians, but I severed some ties even with people in my life who were amongst the most important and influential people in my life because I knew how they voted. I knew they were blue voters. I, I had to... It took me a little bit of time, but I came to a place where I said, okay, this person, XYZ person, was was a was a was a such such an important person in my life and helping me become a, a man and an adult and a and a responsible person. But I know how they're voting. Yeah, I know the prior 20 years was a lot, but you know what? It's more important than here and now. That that binary black and white thinking, what it does is it creates trauma. And I'm going to use the word trauma as someone who, again, is not uh, trained and credentialed whatsoever. Because the right wing, there's three words that I use to describe the right wing mythologies that I, that I succumb to. Trauma, desperation, and panic. And I use those words to emphasize that I think the general public underestimates just how easy it is to fall prey to so many right-wing mythologies. Because there is that, there is that notion of, well, the, the, the highly uneducated, the poorly educated. No, there's plenty of education. I have a college degree. I was an English major, studied, you know, went into journalism, as I mentioned. I mean, you know, I'm not, not the brightest light bulb, but I'm not the dimmest either. And, 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 and I allowed myself to fall prey to those mythologies. And it's something that's so important in remembering as we engage MAGA voters. I, I just wanted to, to... I want to give you a little bit more uh, uh, credit than you're giving yourself. Um, one thing that is really important um, that I've learned is that no one, zero people, have brainwashed themselves in the history of mankind. Um, brainwashing and, and undue influence, by definition, is somebody external to you um, attacking you psychologically you know, um, harming you uh, so that your thoughts become what they want. It is a version of mind control, and it is not something that people volunteer for or even allow themselves. Um, it is your the fact that you are were anti-establishment as a as a college person uh, should not mean that a foreign enemy. Uh, nation and a bunch of traitors in America should be able to psychologically, you know, traumatize and trap you into 
a cult. Um, what you said about about splitting off from people you care about is the surest and most simple sign of being in a cult. Um, what cults do is, and, and Dr. Hassan is a, is a friend of mine and a mentor, and I, I would not be here without him. Um, um, and so a lot of this I've just learned straight from him. Um, but there's an in-group and an out-group, right? You are on one side or the other. And if you're on the other side of the line, not only are you not part of the family, you are the enemy, right? And and so one of the things that that I think you know I just want to to emphasize is, for example, when Hillary said the deplorables in the same sentence, she said half of half are not right, half are just normal folks. Um, but the the complicit media in the right wing psychological war machine, along with Russia grab that cherry pick that one line and turned it into into something that would brighten that line between the in group and the out group exactly and you described it so well in that um in the rally where you 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 could just feel that that you know bond get closer as the cult leader was um you know uh, being attacked and therefore you felt attacked as well. The only reason I say these things is just to provide a little bit of, of my understanding, my con my context or, around how I see your experience because I see so many people with exactly the same um, background. And thank you, by the way, also for for you know mentioning that that you were a third party guy, right? And there's lots of people who are like who are like that who think you know and for uh, lots of good reasons that that we need a, a an upgrade on you know on our system. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, and it should not mean that somebody should be able to take those ideas and turn them against you and weaponize you for their goals. Um, so I, I just felt you know as you've been been speaking and. And I, and I recognize that you're trying to take responsibility and I'm, I will land my plane in a second. Um, I know you're just trying to take responsibility for your actions and I really appreciate that. Um, but for me, I think it's also very important to, to recognize and extend grace, um, not only to people who have figured out how to get out like you have. And by the way, congratulations. That is not easy. Um, but, but, you know, also extend grace to people who are still affected, who are still casualties of psychological warfare. I mean, that's what it is. Um, and so um, I is. just wanted to, I, I wanted to, to, to provide that context to you. Um, thank you so much for your experience for, and for being willing to say this stuff out loud. Absolutely. Um, for, for me, it, 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 it fills me with with you know joy might not be the right word but hope I think um, because hearing intelligent people who figured it out and are willing to work um, is just so important so uh, thank you for that and I'm sorry it wasn't really a question <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> no that, it's that, beautiful it, it that that means a lot to me to say that Jim and all of you for for saying that something that I have I say on a daily basis now is I tell those who want to know more, thank you for caring because I never thought anyone would really care. And it is important to emphasize that point you're making about how to, how to resist the temptation of dehumanizing MAGA voters because if our goal is to help others leave MAGA, to move the country forward past MAGA, it's not that MAGA is going to go away. MAGA is just the latest, yeah. but not the last iteration of the right wing. Yeah. So it's always going to, it's always in some form going to be here, just like the Confederacy in some form remains, just like the Southern strategy 
remains and the Tea Party, all of these various groups that that are very effectively sold mythologically as these organically formed grassroots organizations, but in reality are just funded by the dark money and not even from that many dark donors. It's really a handful of those who have had their hands in all this from the Cokes to the Leonard Leos and all of these other groups like Turning Point and Moms for Liberty and, and, and the Tea Party and the next one that'll come along. They're just well-funded, designed to, designed to try to show the public, well, you know, I guess there are a lot more people concerned about parents' rights and states' rights than we know of. But in reality, they're not what they appear. They're not right. in reality. What? But it's the perception versus reality right. conflict. Right. And I and I and I allowed myself to be guided solely, Jim, by perception. And I think that anyone and we all decide we all decipher information to some extent on perception. We we know this. But if someone is whose entire worldview is solely perceptual, that person is more susceptible to manipulation. And because of that reason, it's why when we look at MAGA voters and we say, okay, we want to move the country past MAGA. We want to help them leave MAGA. We want to persuade them. We have to first acknowledge that this is a good person, most likely deep down. And secondly, that there were some actual valid reasons for supporting the Trump campaign. Once that's occurred, because that's the bedrock of my work, once that's happened, all of a sudden the defensiveness starts to kind of melt away a little bit. The, we, we've disarmed the situation. We can now have maybe a, a healthier version of some conflict because I remember, and I think back to what people would have said when they, when they talked about the evils of MAGA voters, they were talking about me. When I was a Trump supporter, even though Heidi, I didn't, the election was stolen, and I didn't think the COVID vaccine made us into a three-eyed cyclops. No disrespect to any three-eyed cyclops out there. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually think that. Uh, and, and even when Trump was managing COVID, I had to turn the press conferences off. I couldn't stand watching them. And even as much as he botched it, it still wasn't enough for me to lose my support for Trump. Oh. And, and, and Jim, when you said before about, about the difficulties in leaving, I, I think that might be a perfect segue into, uh, it's, it's in a way, I call it the year of heaven and hell, because it was in the summer of 2021 when the doubt started to creep in. Now, as a Floridian, I mention this all the time. It was actually DeSantis who was the catalyst for my leaving MAGA. And, and how did that actually happen? So I mentioned before I had a kid in 16, I had another kid in 2019. Uh, in fairness to Ron DeSantis, and I feel like I try to, I wanna be as objective as I can here. I feel like it, in fairness to Ron DeSantis, the first year and a half of the pandemic, I thought he handled it as well as he could have. He was, he was uh, an advocate, for some of the public health measures. He, he, he helped to, to design the system to get the vaccine to senior citizens. Um, he was encouraging people to, to follow some of the, the recommendations. There were even some strategic closures. There's even a famous photo, if you guys remember this, out there for viewers and listeners, remember this. He was, he was pushing a senior citizen in a wheelchair to go and get their vaccine. And I remember thinking, okay, this is, and I in compared and contrasted to Trump, I thought, DeSantis is actually doing a good job as a leader with this pandemic. Summer 21 comes around, and if everybody remembers, that was the Delta surge. And more and more, I started to see reports in Florida and nationwide about children falling ill with COVID. Even the rare deaths of children uh, acquiring COVID and then dying. And I'm not suggesting that any other age group who were, who were suffering and dying from COVID is any less tragic. But when kids are getting sick, it means that the disease is becoming deadly or more infectious. Now, at that point, if you remember back in the summer of 2021, the anti-COVID vaccine hysteria and propaganda was in full force. It had permeated itself all across MAGA, all across the right wing. And I remember saying to others here, which again, remember, I'm still MAGA at this point. 
remember saying to others, you know what? DeSantis is going to divorce himself from the anti-vaccine hysteria. He's going he's gonna to sever ties because he's done a good job, in my view, up to this point. He's going to continue to do that good job. And overnight, he became the exact opposite. And he didn't just come out with a position of, get the vaccine, I'm against mandates. I don't agree with that position. However, it's still somewhat more logically defensible. Get the vaccine, I advocate the vaccine, I'm against mandates. Okay, we can maybe find some middle ground there. That's not what he did. He came out and then began what eventually just devolved over time to the point of now where he came out in opposition to this vaccine, saying that it was injuring people, saying that it was harming other people, saying that it wasn't working. It was like I ran face first into a brick wall. I mean, imagine running face first into a brick wall. It was at that moment, something in me, there was some kind of intuitive alarm that went off. And I remember when kids were getting sick and they were dying and the guy I thought was a good leader, whom, by the way, I supported in the primary. I made volunteer phone calls on behalf of him. I voted for him. And all of a sudden I came to realize that he's now accepting avoidable deaths and suffering. It was not just the gut punch. It was like drop the ton of bricks on my head. And that's where it started. And I started to think, wait a minute, this, how could, the, at first there's a little bit of shock and denial. How could this be? You know, how, what has caused this? And then, and then, you know, you start, you start looking for the answers. What has caused this to happen? But then something else occurred in my life. Remember, summer of 21, I had a one-two punch. I mentioned before, I didn't think the election was ever stolen. But six months after the insurrection, I was still in this position of, well, it wasn't good, but what's the big deal? We keep hyping this up. Let's just move on from it. It was a bad day. Let's get over it. But something, as that internal alarm went off, I decided to delve a little deep into some of the forces and groups who contributed to what happened that day. Whether you want to call it an insurrection or a riot, it's a semantic difference. It was a riot. It was an attempt. It was a coup d'etat is what it was. So I started to, I started to dig deep and I said, who, you know, I knew these groups like QAnon and the Proud Boys. And I said, yeah, but you know, these guys are just hobbyist groups. You know, they're just people sitting around. They got all the time in the world. You know, the pandemic, everyone's on the internet 24 hours a day. These guys are not, they're, they're just, they're just a, you know, they're like a gamer group just hanging out and, and exchanging messages online about whatever conspiracy they're into. I discovered that actually wasn't the case. And I came to realize that all these groups like QAnon and the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters and the Oath Keepers were not hobbyists. They were well-coordinated. They were, in some parts, well-funded. And I think maybe worst of all, they had the blessing of the most powerful person in the world. When I realized that as well, when I got over that, that ignorance that I, well, I was highly, highly ignorant about those forces and groups that led to the insurrection, I thought, I cannot believe how wrong I was. So I had on one hand, Ron DeSantis, who as, a, as an extension of the right wing in the GOP, made acceptable, avoidable deaths and suffering. And then the other side of this, which was Trump and MAGA and, and the Republican Party apparatus and the right wing, who said that it was okay. They defended and justified politically motivated violence in a coup d'etat against our, we the people, against our government, our democracy, and our constitution. And this next point is one I bring up a lot because I think it's so, it's, it's a detail that's a little bit overlooked. The rioters were 40 feet away from Mike Pence. If they had gotten a hold of him, he would have been murdered or rendered incapacitated. And if that had happened, we have no constitutional backup plan on how to, on how to count and finally and certify those, those votes that day. We would have had nothing, we would not have known what to do. For the first time in American history, the Constitution would have been suspended, 40 feet away. So we've got one line of demarcation, acceptable deaths and suffering, the other line of demarcation that, uh, that, uh, it's, that the January 6th insurrection was polit legitimate political discourse is what the Republican Party called it. When I came to those two lines of demarcation, guys, I did not cross them. I, I had to make a decision. 
do I cross these lines and, and, and by crossing those lines, accept everything that has made me doubt my support or do I not cross them? And I decided not to cross them. And, 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 and thank you for that. There's another what if very important to my story and I think will be important to others whom we try to persuade to leave MAGA. If I had crossed those lines that day, that moment in time in the summer of 2021, when I first started to think about this, it took me an entire year to conclude I was wrong. And in that year's time, I'm not going to sugarcoat this because the idea that, hey, uh, hey, when I, well, aren't you wrong about MAG? And people wake up and think, yeah, yeah, I was wrong. They wake up one day after just being so invested emotionally and morally and sometimes financially for year after year after year in MAGA and in Trump to just say, wake up and say, I was wrong. No, it was a year of heaven and hell. I was at a mental and spiritual and, and moral war. It was an internecine personal war politically. And then I had this political and personal epiphany, this road to Damascus moment where the scales fall from the eye, just like the story of Saul, the, the scales just fall down and you see now. It was a year's time and I said, going to support this anymore. I cannot in good conscience stand by and watch this and support it. And it was a year. It was an entire year. And if I crossed those lines, I don't believe I would have ever been able to come back from it. So I don't think so. So it's really hard not to like applaud right now, but I'm just giving it a moment. I, what you just described is the life's work of the gentlemen that are uh, that are here today, Jim and Hi-Fi. They have been warning about this type of indoctrination. They have been, you know, uh, uh, this has been their 24 seven mission to make America aware of it. And uh, you just validated uh, the years of blood, sweat and tears they put into their own work. But I just wanna say, you also described beautifully and poignantly that when people realize they don't want to participate in something and they realize they went too far down a very treacherous slope. We've talked about this before. There is shame involved. Nobody says, hey, look at me, I'm cool. So thank you so much for describing that year long process because I wanna give people that space, that space to heal, that space to kind of look around and who's still left in your life that you can reach out to that is so incredibly important. And uh, one word on that shame, and then I know the guys want to jump in, and I've got a final question. Sure. Uh, you, you said heal, so apropos, so on point, because as painful as it was, and it was painful, there's this tug of war constantly. Do I get out? Do I get in? Do I get out? Do I get in? When you make the decision and you know when you've made it, because sometimes it's, again, we're not realizing it in real time, but when that decision is made, as painful as it might have been, it is so liberating. And I realized that I became what I was fighting. I was, I was fighting tyranny. In reality, I became a tyrant in my own home. My wife was naturalized. Uh, she's, a, she's, she's a naturalized American. 2016 was her first election. She could vote in. Um, and and, and I, she doesn't mind me saying this. She's, she's not giving me the evil Wi-Fi when I say this. Um, you know, that, that, what, what did you say about me? She voted for Trump in 2016 to support me, even though she wanted to vote for Hillary. Same in 2020, supported Trump to support me. Now, aside from the fact that I am married to my wife for 15 years and I definitely married up, that says much more, I think, about my wife than I. However, what it does say about me is that I became a tyrant in my own home. And over the course of leaving MAGA, doesn't happen overnight, but over the course of it, as you heal, you begin to forgive yourself. Because if I'm going to get out there and I'm going to talk to those in MAGA, and I'm, and I'm going to look to persuade them about why life will be better leaving MAGA. I had to have come to a point where I had inner 
peace. I can't ask others to seek that. I do not. It would make me a hypocrite. And when I decided to apologize, you know, it's not a natural act to apologize. You know, maybe you tell a couple people here and there, you whisper it, oh, I was wrong. Oh, okay, honey, that's nice. What's for dinner? I decided to publicize it to millions of people, right? I mean, I wrote in, in Salon, in Newsweek, in the New Republic. It was just like, well, I don't think anyone's going to really give a shit about this. But you know what? For my own personal closure, I'm going to go out and write it. And yeah, you know, a couple people here and there say it. I'll be cool. No, nope, that's not what happened. What I realized is so many people care. I'm here with you right now because you care, which means more than any other, more than money, more than fading praise, more than any of that, that you care. And I didn't think people would. But if I was able to do it, others can. I know that others can because of the fact that I did. I'd like to ask you a question about your emotions. And when I say emotions, really what I'm referring to, I'm not a neuroscientist, but we kind of know how the brain works, right? When you feel good, it's the dopamine. When you get the flight or flight, it's the adrenaline, you know. Um, during your time in Mecca, when you look back now, do you understand or do you feel that your emotions, that your neurochemicals were manipulated. And when you left, did you have a crash? That's a really great question that I think is an overlooked question about being in cult-like environments, in my case with MAGA. My entire time in MAGA was a constant adrenaline rush. The idea that you're that you're some kind of and I don't want to use the word holy because I always joke I'm an excommunicated Catholic. Um, I wasn't even that religious, you know, in MAGA. But it's like this idea of being a holy patriotic soldier. soldier. All you are, you're, 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 you're on a constant fight. It's never ending adrenaline rushes. And because one is on and, and, and when someone is purely running on adrenaline, and in my case, almost entirely on perception, and also finding another overlooked part about the MAGA world, that community. I was, I was in a community of like-minded soldiers. We were on the right side. We had a variety of religions and you know, a couple, couple non-whites here and there, okay? But we, we, were, we were a mix of people, different ages, different backgrounds, different education levels, but we were all united in the goal. And when we were in united in the goal, being a soldier and – I've never served in the military. I have nothing but the utmost respect for our servicemen and women. I can imagine um, in, a, in a cerebral way, not in a real life way, but I can imagine just what the emotions are, the adrenaline on the battlefield when you're actually in war. All you're thinking about is survival. That's what it was with us in MAGA. That's, you know, Hi-Fi, that's that crash that you're mentioning. It was, I mean, it, it, was, it was like a crash at the speed of light. I mean, that's how, that, 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 that's how fast, that's how hard the impact was. And when that crash happens is the first time that the doubt starts to creep in. And I think that there are so many amongst us who have some doubt that either has started to creep in, they're in the, maybe the nascent stages of remorse, or maybe they're, they're approaching the quiet quitting phase. There are so many more out there, I think, than we realize. And I'm not saying that I'll be the sole voice for this. I'm interested in collaboration, not competition. But I've said, use my story, my experience as a, as a, as a voice, as a means by which to help people eventually leave behind MAGA. Not in a judgmental way, because good people of good character, of, 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 of high education in some cases, they they fell prey to this. They fell prey. We fell prey. I fell prey to the adrenaline rush of, of constantly being in that battle. I was in it. And I know that there are out there who are. And if I didn't, I never imagined doing this work. I, I mean, it's the God's honest truth. You hooked a lie detector test up to me and said, Rich, you imagine a year from now, you know, you're going to be with Heidi and Jim and Hi-Fi talking about leaving MAGA to a global audience. <laughs> I'd be like, are you fucking crazy? Like, 
you know, I mean, Nadine Smith, right, who was who was on the show recently. I met her at an event uh, recently at Howard University. I got up and spoke and said, hey, if you, it was at the uh, the center founded by the creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones. I got up and said, if you had told me three years ago I'd be at an event at a center founded by the creator of the 1619 Project, I'd have said, <laughs> and I don't know if this is still said, I'd have said, you bug it. Like, that would be, I mean, like, like, I, like, I would have more likely been, like, it, it, on a deserted island than it had been in an event hosted by the creator of the 1619 Project. But mm-hmm. it goes to show also that one of the, one of the techniques of weaving MAGA for me, it's going to sound so simple what I'm about to say, diversifying my news and information sources. In Ooh. MAGA, in MAGA, you close off Ooh. everything. Anything that is not 100% meeting the purity test. New York Times, oh, enemy. Washington Post, enemy. The Atlantic, enemy. You name it, right? Oh, if it's not, even Fox News, we looked at Fox as, eh, they're squishy. They're kind of squishes, right? Yeah. If, it, if, if it wasn't passing the purity test, yes. it, was, it was rejected. So all of a sudden, when I started to have doubt, I started to look elsewhere compared to just the, 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 the narrow the narrow media I was consuming. And I thought, wow, there's actually a whole world out there that I closed myself off from. And it was one of the parts of coming to the place where I said, I'm at peace now. I'm leaving MAGA, I'm leaving it. And I went back, Heidi, and I reconnected with those I cut my, I I severed ties with. And I said, I respect. If you will not accept my apology, I will, I will respect that decision. However, I want you to know that I was wrong and I'm sorry. And everyone except one person, and I'll eventually work on him and we'll get there. <laughs> uh, I, I, I told him, I said, if you thought I was a, you thought I was a pain in the ass in MAGA, you ain't said <laughs> shit. You're a pain in the <laughs> All of the other ones said to me, yes, Rich. in fact, one said, and, and I get, I even, you know, get a little emotional thinking about it this way. Someone who was so important in my life, gave me so many opportunities to succeed, forgave some of my mistakes when he didn't need to. He said to me, Rich, apology accepted. I always knew you'd come back. Oh. And I, and I, and I say this because it's so important for people to not give up on their friends and their family, their close ones or who were in MAGA. If they had given up on me, those individuals, those important people, if they gave up on me, I would not be here with you right now. 100% sure of it, I wouldn't be here joining you today. It's the most most important thing I think everyone needs to hear because I hear all the time, um, you know, uh, just give up on them. There's, there's no way. They're not coming back, right? And I just I, – I, it, it kills me, and I, I'm just so grateful to hear hear you – say it um, in the eloquent way you're saying it. Um, Thank one you. thing that I'm very curious about, because you anticipated my question, which is getting out of, of a cult um, or is all about getting out of an insulated information environment, right? They used to take you to a compound in Waco or whatever and, and insulate you that way, right? What what MAGA, you know, in this era has been able to do is use social media to create that yes. insulated yeah. environment, right? So I guess my curiosity is because at, at the center is also another important thing I want to say that you are elucidating. No one gets forced out of a cult. No one gets deprogrammed. And Dr. Hassan will be the first to tell you this. Um, you find your own way out, right? Yeah. It's just about yes. lighting up the hallways so that people can decide for themselves instead of just being in this sort of echo chamber virtual reality thing where there's no other, where the real world doesn't exist, right? So my curiosity really comes from how, how did you even make the decision to peek out the, the door, right? Because as soon as you do, isn't there, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there, right? There's a lot of weight, you know, all the things that I have been taught, you know, that I have been teaching others for years now, there's a whole world that's telling me that's wrong. So how do you, how do you even, how did you even crack that door open? 
you know, you guys mentioned before about uh, no one consciously decides to involve oneself, let's say, in a cult. Um, it isn't like, okay, New Year's resolutions, you know, get healthy, lose weight, join cult, right? It's like, you know, like no one is like, they we're not creating that. I never created that list, right? It was just, it, it just, in, in the way that it gradually happened, I would say, Jim, the counter, the, con the conversely speaking, there's also a gradual exit. And I always like to paraphrase Hemingway on this, that I always say my personal and political epiphany happened gradually and then suddenly all at once. Because once I started to, w once it became clear to me that in this case, the catalyst, Ron DeSantis, who's very, who very clearly then and now is MAGA, once I saw what he was doing as it pertained to kids, and yes, I will fully admit as a parent, it hit me different. Mm -hmm. it, it, it did hit me different. And I, I, I don't, you know, as Dr. Hassan had said in an interview I did with him, he said how becoming a parent can sometimes also change that perspective uh, compared to, it could be the same occurrence, but we look at it differently as a parent or not a parent. When I started seeing kids getting sick, okay, I wasn't that concerned about my own kids getting sick, but I was thinking, but he's now actively undermining and attacking some of the solutions to reduce the number of kids and others getting sick and dying. It yeah. became, you know, on one hand, Jim, it became at one time it was it was life or death in MAGA. I, I, I had to we had to save America. We had to preserve our union and 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 make sure that the, we crushed our enemies who would otherwise want to take over. But that was desperation speaking it was trauma it was panic all of a sudden with ron DeSantis, it was now actual truly real life it was actual real life and death and and it and it wasn't like i just said not right now it was that very beginning stages of there's this internal processing you know the mind like being the computer it's like all of a sudden it's processing all of this various inf it's like code and software it's all these different characters and we're sitting here trying to make sense of it all like what does it mean uh am i am i am i misinterpreting this am i misconstruing what's really happening um do i understand this let me ask a couple other people and they said well rich you know uh no you're not really misconstruing it you're you're you know ron, ron DeSantis is being a good leader and he's you know he's he's, he's fighting the jab and i remember saying to others though yeah but i mean kids are getting sick right i mean you know i mean what what Shouldn't there be some, shouldn't that be somewhat incorporated into, into our thinking? Well, yeah, you know, it's tough that you're getting sick, but you know, at, at the end of the day, it's no different from a cold or the flu. I was hearing that. So, so all of a sudden I'm sitting there going, well, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel like, uh, I'm starting to feel like, okay, that's not what I was expecting entirely. I knew that the MAGA side was thought that COVID was no worse than a common cold or a flu and, and sadly, I saw people I knew down here get COVID and get hospitalized and die in the hospital. And I felt awful about that. You know, people who would go on radio shows and talk about COVID's fake, it's not real, the jab is, the jab's going to kill you. And I saw screenshots of some of these people after being hospitalized sent to their girlfriends and their spouses. And it said, in, and these screenshots said, I, I shouldn't have said what I said about COVID and the vaccine. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And many of them, you know, a handful I knew did did pass away in the hospital. And I, and I just remember thinking, like, there is so much death throughout this this way of life, this way of being. You know, the defense and justification of of people dying in the name of this this mythological version of freedom. There's no fucking freedom when you're dead. It's like, why why was it that we just like why you know like I mean I guess depending on the religion some might feel that way okay you know I, I get it like in a faith way but when kids are starting to get this way and we've watched senior citizens die and we've watched people not be able to be with their loved ones because of this virus it just all came to this crashing halt it was like this wave that just built and built and built and then it just hit me it was like this tsunami of doubt that just came and washed over me and I just thought year went on and then looking at january 6 and watching and of course trump continuing with the with the traumatic rhetoric of the stolen election which i didn't believe anyway now i started to become not emotionally speaking but angrier about it all of this the confluence of these factors yes it took gradual phase for me to come out of it 
But I, but at the same time, Jim, I, I guess I want to say I allowed myself to let it happen because I feel like if I allowed myself to fall prey to the right wing mythologies, I would like to, and I appreciate what you said before about giving some more credit. I, I thank you for saying that. I, I want to mention the part of the agency that I want others to feel like that as difficult as it will be, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that, it is possible, but it's going to be a challenge. In fact, I actually would say that other than anything like being in business and being a parent, a husband, leaving MAGA is one of the most difficult endeavors I've ever, I've ever undergone. Uh, it, I mean, it, it really was because it's like you're sitting there. I, I had so much emotional investment in MAGA for more than half a decade. And then to all of a sudden come to the realization I was wrong. I cannot support this anymore. And I don't want to give myself credit for it, Jim. Again, thank you for that. But I want to emphasize that as we go and look to persuade others to leave MAGA, I'm a real life example, right? When people who are anti-MAGA want to go in and, and just, how could you keep doing this? You know, you're in a cult. Why don't you see that? How come you don't realize this? Why don't you know that Donald Trump and whomever is manipulating your emotions? All that's doing is making them feel more right, more correct, right? Jim, to your point on that. And, and, I, and I went through, for me, it was just me and my thoughts at night. It was yeah. just me sitting there in the dark, sitting yeah. there going, wait a minute. Uh, how, you start to think about if I actually decided to, 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 to repudiate what I believed, what is my life going to be like then? Yeah. These thoughts go through our mind and there's a lot of it makes you afraid. You know, we're normal beings. I was I was this uncertainty about it. The where am I? Where is it going to lead me? But ultimately, I had to I had to listen to my conscience. So I had to I say, yes, that's, that, that's, yes, yes, please. Rich. So I want to go back just a little bit because you said these things are like a program. It's like lines of code and people are the computer. I would offer you the following assessment. You can agree with it or disagree with it. Sure. These psychological operations that were run against America that led to the creation of MAGA, that led to the Proud Boys, that led to all of this, that led to the attempted coup on January 6th, those things were a hack mm -hmm. of people's minds and people's emotions. And what happened to you is they hit a firewall inside your head. Mm -hmm. Denying science is not a firewall that you can, that you can accept. Right. Looking around and seeing that there are AstroTurf organized funded operations behind MAGA that hit your firewall. So whoever programmed you to have that firewall as a kid, good on them. And I'm glad. <laughs> it still well, thank um, you. High five. you know, my th thank you. High five for saying that. And this is at this point, I'm just going to mention, I'm thinking about it is, is a point that sometimes some find surprising. And I understand why my parents were not at all political. Mm -hmm. They were opinionated. But they weren't political. They didn't vote. So I didn't grow up in a household where, you know, my folks would say, well, you know, back in the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, we, we fought for civil rights. We fought for equality. We, we wanted people to be considered equal, like the, like the, the founding ideals of our nation, that all, all men are created equal. My parents, did, we did not talk that way in my household. And being around others in college who started to help me develop some of my political sensibilities I was very political for many years, but I was also very, very ignorant. And it's not stupidity when I say to people when they're ignorant, it's not stupidity, but, but ignorance is, it is one of the gateways to becoming subsumed by the right wing ethos yeah. because I never consider myself a conservative. In fact, I look at conservatism right now, and while I'm not going to say writ large that I think it's entirely all wrong. I'm very thankful that there are anti-MAGA conservatives who are aligning with those opposed to Trump. However, I, I think that there's a reckoning due in America on conservatism because conservatism is not the only, it's not the sole culprit, but it's the primary culprit that did create the opening for MAGA. 
because right-wing mythologies always come back to some form of LGBTQ, sex, marriage, white race, Christian theocracy, all of these- Culture all war. These, cult, it's, Culture it's war. All designed to create desperation and panic. And that's why the right wing very effectively understands that change is something we are adverse to as a species. So when they look around and they might see, let's say, senior citizens who are, who are white, Christian, the demographic changes around them. I'm not going to say that the some of the phobia they have means that they are racist, but it's that the the changes occurring around them they're not they grew up a certain way now they're yeah. now they're in the, the the you know hopefully many many years but they're in the, the they're in the 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 maybe one third of their life right now where they're seeing everything change around them the right yeah. wing comes in and says oh you see this book a book that yeah. literally no one ever knew was in the library itself and they say look at this book in the yeah. children's right in the, in the in the right again here we go right read the yeah. Look at and this book in, in injecting, injecting fear, injecting right. fear, injecting othering, all those things. Okay. Um, Rich Lodges, I just want to thank you. And I know Jim and Hi-Fi feel the same way. I've been very emotional, very misty during this interview because A, it's been a long seven years and B, women lost a lot. And when you describe people saying, who is Hillary Clinton? What is she? you know, state senator or secretary of state, somebody who tried to solve the health crises, uh, you know, of our, uh, you know, terrible health system decades ago, you know, somebody who has been on uh, the right path for what, and, and as you said, would have been a much better leader during COVID. So women of my generation lost a lot, but what you just did was a huge amends to our global audience and also a beautiful, beautiful uh, explainer filled with tremendous integrity on your journey. And you're gonna help so many people. And for those who want to reach out to Rich, you can find him at per, uh, perfectourunion.us. He's also forming an organization, Leaving MAGA. He's a safe space for those of you flooded with doubt but what I would like you to do is leave our viewers with the most important um, one or two liners, lightning round to let them know it's okay to leave MAGA. It is okay to, to realize and say that we're wrong. In fact, I think that when we acknowledge publicly that we were wrong about something, it makes us more invested in our democracy. It does mend and strengthen civic ties and whatever our flaws in our history the reason i i call what we're doing uh where my work is perfect our union is because in the preamble of the constitution it's i believe the most aspirational mythology ever penned right we the people of the united states in order to form a more perfect union democracy is hard but one of the reasons that america's democracy has survived sometimes it's thrived but it's survived also is because we have had moments in history where unlikely but necessary alliances are formed. And for those out there who are having that doubt about MAGA and about Trump, it's perfectly okay to have those doubts. And it's okay for us to say we were mistaken because when we form unlikely alliances in our history, part of the reason that happens is people saying, I was mistaken. And now I'm gonna side on, on, on that side of equality and strengthening our democracy. And I think that next year is going to be a historic repudiation of the right wing. However, having said that, no one should construe that statement as anything except urgent. Anyone who's not registered to vote, get registered. Talk to our friends and family, are you registered? If they don't know how to do it, Heidi, contact me and I'll show anyone around the country how to get registered. What the last seven plus years have shown is that elections do matter and that sitting home and not voting and not participating in the democratic process does matter. And it also shows that we're not, that our two parties are not quite the same. And I say that as someone who is not a registered Democrat. However, I will vote Democrat because this Republican party must be mercy killed. It is not a party that can be saved any longer. And, and I say that not to be a partisan, but because coming out of MAGA, it opened up an entire world where now I like to think I view the world with a little bit more reality 
and a little bit less perception. So for those out there who, who are, are not sure if, where they are in their journey, whether it's for themselves or others, contact me, please. Let me be someone who can try to offer some guidance and some counsel. Rich Lodges. Rich Lodges, we thank you. You honored us here today. We're very indebted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. So guys, <laughs> I don't know what to say other than I am grateful. All I want for Christmas is for people's brains to stop being hacked. Thank you.